So continuing on with our project where we're discussing anatomy, so specific anatomical regions, but more so with the central portion of our meaning network or our semantic network being particular motions, we're going to look at pelvic flexion. Now I'm going to specifically note that this term that I'm using does not necessarily hold consistent with what would be broadly discussed in the osteopathic world or even the manual therapy world. And there are reasons for that, which we'll explain. Now, the first thing that I will say is that there is a consistent historical perspective or a consistent behavioral perspective where the pelvis is not necessarily considered to move specifically as a unit. It's considered to move as a unit as well as independent halves. Uh, in osteopathy, you will often hear the term innominate bone or the fusion of the pubis, the ischium, and the ilium in adults, but you will hear the concept and the discussion suggesting that they will move somewhat independently of, of one another. They can go upwards, downwards, roll forwards, roll backwards, flare in and out. So that discussion is consistent within osteopathic history and there is consistent behavior associated with that belief that that is something that is observable and identifiable. And there's a consistent set of positive outcomes with respect to that belief and that behavior. Now, that said, I will not discuss it in that fashion on simple account of the fact that there is no observable evidence that it truly does that thing or those movements as independent halves in relation to itself, so either side of the pelvis or in relation to the sacrum. Most sources are going to note motion of the sacrum between the pelvic bones somewhere between one and five degrees. You will see some variation depending on the particular source with one source that I remember saying that you will note up to 10 degrees of motion of the sacrum in between the pelvic bones in adult female gymnasts. Now that said, that 10 degrees is a rare thing. It is in a small population worldwide, whereas the vast majority of the population has a much smaller amount of observable motion in any way, which would be hard to detect from the outside. And also with respect to the tests that are commonly used for detecting pelvic motion within this paradigm, they are very unlikely doing what they say they are doing. So they're very likely to be invalid tests for their claims. Now, after all that preamble, what we're talking about is pelvic flexion. So we will describe what we mean by that. So the goals here are to discuss, have the specific discussion of pelvic flexion, the planes and axes, and why I'm not using the terms pelvic tilt or nominal rotation. And we've already done a little bit about that, but we'll get into that a little bit more. General discussion of the muscles that flex the pelvis as a unit. General discussion of the nerves that supply those muscles, which will flex the pelvis as a unit. A general discussion of the vascular supply for those muscles. A very superficial discussion of the female re reproductive system, including ligaments and the urinary system. And the reason that we're doing that is as we go through the torso, uh, so the head, neck, torso, and pelvic region, there are organs associated with these regions and with these motions. So we break it up such that those discussions are part of the semantic network. Then we'll have a general discussion of the areas to assess and treat should pelvic flexion issues be suspected or reported. So pelvic flexion or flexion in general, we just have our quick overview of planes. The sagittal plane is a 50% cut left to right. The horizontal plane or transverse plane is a 50% cut top to bottom. And the frontal plane or the coronal plane is a 50% cut back to front. Axes are perpendicular to plane. So in this case, the sagittal plane, we have a horizontal or transverse axis. So what we have is rotation or forward bending and backwards bending in the sagittal plane. So when it's bending towards the front, we call that flexion. So essentially, if you are going to conceptualize this, the pelvis either gets pulled upwards towards the front of the body or the front of the torso, the abdomen gets pulled towards the, the pelvis and you would call that pelvic flexion. Now, again, I understand that this is not necessarily consistent with the general discussion within manual therapy or the osteopathic profession. And there are reasons for that. As already noted, these structures in, the, in either half of the pelvis or the sacrum are not noted to have large amounts of motion with respect to one another. Now, if you look at the pelvis, so we have a representation of a pelvis with its ligamentous structures. So you have both halves and then you have all of the ligaments. So the anterior longitudinal ligament is identifiable on the front of the lumbar vertebrae on the top picture and going down the anterior portion of the sacrum, you have the sacral tubers and the sacrospinous ligaments, which are tethering more or less the sacrum at the bottom. 
to the ischium. So that would suggest that you want to restrict motion heavily, at least if you're being philosophical about it. And this does match observation that the sacrum does not move much in between the pelvic bones. You have the anterior sacral iliac ligament, the interosseous sacral iliac ligament, the long posterior sacral iliac ligament, or the long dorsal ligament. There's different names for it but you have a very large amount of ligaments here to tie these structures together at the frontier of the pubic symphysis, which does have a cartilaginous disc or a fibrocartilaginous disc, and you have ligament structures there as well, but you also have a lot of tendinous structures. These bones are not noted to move in relation to one another, especially in the large or the broad public base, the broad base of possible patients. These bones are not known to move with respect to one another. Now, if you take the term pelvic tilt, all right, so an anterior pelvic tilt or a posterior pelvic tilt, the pelvis is not something that will move independently. It has muscles that are connected to it above and below, and those are the things that would generally create its motion. So what I'm going to put forth is that a conceptual way to view this is that up an anterior pelvic tilt is really lumbar extension, and a posterior pelvic tilt is really torso flexion. And the reason for that is because of the muscles that attach, where they attach and how they generate motion. So essentially what you're doing, a posterior tilt is approximation of the front of the torso or the abdomen and the front of the pelvis. So we can just call that lumbar flexion. Uh, anterior tilt is an approximation of the backside of the pelvis to the lumbar region or the posterior lumbar region. And we can call that lumbar extension. So that's why I won't call it anterior posterior pelvic tilt because the focus goes to the pelvis when realistically the things that are moving it and the joints that move are contained within the lumbar region. And then we won't talk about innominate rotations, flares, shears, anything like that, because we can consistently observe in most sources that have ever examined a pelvis that they, the two halves don't really move much in relation to one another such that it's negligible. And there are other much larger motions that are much more likely to be impactful. So we talk about pelvic flexion being approximation of the abdominal wall to the front side of the pelvis or to the pubic symphysis, depending on where you'd like to place your attention. So that said, it says lumbar flexion on the slide because pelvic flexion is lumbar flexion because you have approximation of the abdomen to the pubic symphysis or the, the abdomen to the front side of the pelvis. And you're looking at the rectus abdominis, the internal and external obliques. For the most part here, the transverse abdominis isn't really going to do much. And we've discussed this before with respect to lumbar flexion. Now, the muscle or the nerves rather that are going to supply the region are going to be the intercostal nerves primarily. And in the case of the internal intercostal, or sorry, the internal oblique muscle rather. So please, if I said intercostal muscles in the previous slide, excuse me, it should be uh, the internal oblique and the external oblique. The internal oblique will receive some innervation from the upper regions of the lumbar plexus. So what we're looking at for the most part, the innervation for the abdominal wall to generate this lumbar or pelvic flexion is coming heavily from the intercostal region or from in between the ribs such that if we're considering the motion restriction or the motion change, and we're then trying to track back the neurology, we're tracking a very large area such that it becomes much more useful to pay attention to the change in motion as opposed to the tracking the, neuro the neurology because you're looking at a much larger area and it's much easier to get confused. So if you are noting the motion dysfunction, you will behave more accurately to the problem at hand. If we're looking at the vascular supply, which we've discussed quite a bit, you are looking at the epigastric circulation, which means that you're going as high as the subclavian artery through the internal thoracic or internal mammary to, until that branches off and becomes a superior epigastric. You're looking at the iliac circulation, which has to come off of the abdominal aorta through the, then through the iliac region, sending up the inferior epigastric. And then you're looking to some degree at lumbar circulation or the lumbar arteries. You're looking to some degree at the intercostal arteries as well. So there's a very large area, again, giving us rationale for paying attention to the motion more than tracking the vasculature on simple account of the fact that the motion dysfunction is accurate or an accurate finding. And you can behave with respect to that as opposed to making the assumption that any any lack of motion must have a concomitant relationship to all of its neurovascular pathways, because then you're considering a larger area, it's more confusing. And if you have no findings of motion dysfunction in that larger area, you are behaving inaccurately. So if you pay attention to the motion, you behave accurate to the situation at hand. Now the psoas will be a pelvic flexor in that in a supine position, the psoas is known or agreed to generate lumbar flexion 
from a supine position, not necessarily in standing position. Generally speaking, the action of the psoas in most situations in the lumbar region is considered a stabilizing role. That's what we've been able to observe accurately or with some level of reproducibility, whereas the ability to flex the lumbar column or approximate the torso or the abdomen to the pelvis, the psoas has a role in the supine position. So here you're thinking about the upper lumbar nerves the, and the lumbar arteries to some degree. Now, female reproductive anatomy, we, we're going to be very, very brief with this because we don't necessarily need to get in nitty gritty details. The reason we're discussing this is the general central concept of osteopathic manual practice is that there are mechanical correlates to health and disease states. Now, the uterus being an organ that is contained within the body and having connections to the body wall becomes of interest because if we happen to note or receive a report of some form of challenge with the reproductive system in a female, we can understand that it connects to the body wall. And that's really the biggest take home message of this. So you're going to have the uterus, which is going to essentially be the main site of fetal growth or the growth of a baby, uh, as well as the accumulation and the shedding of the uterine lining uh, with respect to the menstrual cycle. <clears throat> it is smooth muscle as are all other organs. So that's kind of the central piece here. Then you have the fallopian tubes, which will allow transit of eggs from the ovaries to the uterus should fertilization occur. At the bottom of the uterus, you have the cervix, and then you have the vagina, which is the essentially the pathway between the external world and uh, the, the opening at the cervix, then into the, or into or out of, depending on what you're speaking about with respect to the uterus. Now, all of this is contained within ligamentous structure. So you have the broad ligament, which is continuous with the peritoneum. So it's essentially the bottom of the peritoneum. The broad ligament is made up of three subdivided portions or subnamed portions. They're really not separate, but it's the mesometrium or the meso the mesentery of the uterus, the mesosalpinx, uh, the, which is the mesentery of the fallopian tubes, and the mesovarium, which is the mesentery of the ovaries. So meso or mesentery, meaning more or less the orderly, the orderly conduct or the orderly transport of a neurovascular structure or sets of neurovascular structures. And the main thing that is going to travel within the mesometrium, and mesosalpinx, and mesovarium is going to be the ovarian artery. So the ovarian artery providing blood supply to the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, and the top half of the uterus. The bottom half of the uterus is going to receive more blood supply from the uterine artery. But the ovarian artery is also termed in a neutral sense, the gonadal artery, and comes directly off of the abdominal aorta. So we have it descending in an orderly fashion down into the pelvic region, and then being or continuing on an orderly path within the mesentery of the female reproductive organs, which is really made up of folds of the peritoneum. Then you're going to have, and that's going to connect it to the body wall. So the peritoneum being connected to the body wall on the internal structure of the abdominal region. You're going to have things like the uterosacral ligament, the round ligament. So the uterosacral going from uterus to the sacrum, the round ligament. Uh, I am blanking on its specific site, but basically it's going to go to the pubic symphysis. So you're, you have multiple connections to the body wall through varying soft tissue folds or ligaments. And what that does is it suggests to you that if you can identify some form of motion dysfunction in the region that could possibly alter pressure gradients, in the, essentially in the pelvic area, be it in the lumbar region, in the leg or what have you, these connections to the body wall may put some pressure on these neurovascular structures such that if there is a concomitant complaint about challenges with reproductive function, be it with the menstrual cycle or how it's going or with the ability to conceive, things of that nature, you can make the assumption that they connect. You don't know that that's absolutely the case, but what you can do is test it by remedying that motion dysfunction. And if the complaint changes, then in a post hoc way, you have some evidence to believe that, or to gain confidence in your prediction. You don't have absolute proof, but you have reason to gain confidence in your prediction. But this is all hinging on the connection of the female reproductive organs to the body wall through peritoneal folds, which then get other names and either just tie it to the body wall or allow for orderly conduct of neurovascular structures.
Now the urinary system, so we've spoken about the kidneys already, but the urinary system essentially out of the kidneys, you have the ureters traveling downwards through the lumbar region into the pelvic region to the <clears throat> to the bladder. Now the bladder tends to be the most anterior organ in the pelvic region in males and females. And it is going to receive blood from that gonadal artery or in males, the testicular artery, I believe is the proper term, and then the ovarian artery in, in females. But you have blood supply there, and then you're going to have the urine travel downwards into the bladder accumulate. So the, the bladder itself has the trusser muscle, which I believe is autonomically controlled, so it gets to a certain level, and then you'll have the reflex hit it so that the detrusor begins to contract, and then you'll have the internal urethral sphincter, which if memory serves is also autonomically controlled, and then the external urethral sphincter in males and females is controlled uh, consciously. The term escapes me to specifically describe that, but the external urethral sphincter and the external anal sphincter for that matter are consciously controlled. So they're controlled by the central nervous system as opposed to the autonomic nervous system. So they are under conscious control. So you'll have accumulation of urine, some contraction autonomically of the bladder itself through the trusser muscle, I believe the trigon as well, or the trigon the area where it drops down. And then you have orderly exit of that by releasing the, or relaxation of the internal urethral sphincter autonomically and the external urethral sphincter if the person so chooses actively to let it go. So that's why, one of the reasons why you can hold your bathroom function because you can control the external urethral sphincter consciously. And then also if you're considering the urinary system, then the areas that you're looking for mechanical dysfunction, if they relate well to that urinary dysfunction, is the lumbar region, the entire thing, the pelvic region, and to some degree, the, the, upper, the upper leg or the hips, because these are the areas that are going to have large impact on the motion in the abdominal and pelvic regions. So as we already basically noted, the areas of consideration for assessment and treatment of what we're terming pelvic flexion, which is breaking the consistent conversation within both manual therapy and within osteopathy specifically, is we're talking about pelvic flexion or approximation of the abdominal wall and the front of the pelvis, right? So tipping forwards. The areas that you're going to consider, as we've already noted uh, for dysfunction, are the abdominal wall, the lumbar vertebrae, the ribs, because the abdominal musculature will attach to the ribs, the T-spine, broadly speaking, because there can be possibly some interaction with the T-spine and the intercostal ner nerves and the intercostal vasculature and the internal thoracic vasculature. So you're looking at a large area to identify motion dysfunction. You can shortcut this just by doing a full assessment and identifying wherever there happens to be motion dysfunction and treating that. And if there are mechanical correlates to the problem that's being presented, you've likely done the best that you can. But the areas that we're talking about here, the abdominal wall, lumbar vertebrae, ribs, hips, T-spine, broadly speaking, your considerations or your red flags, known or suspected fractures or tears anywhere in there, uh, as well as rebound tenderness of the abdominal wall. If there's rebound tenderness of the abdominal wall for any reason, then that is a visceral pathology until otherwise noted or otherwise diagnosed. So rebound tenderness of the abdominal wall is an immediate referral. Uh, known or suspected fractures or tears. So known fractures is don't treat. Suspected fractures is refer out. Uh, known or suspected aneurysms, as we've noted many times, abdominal aortic aneurysms are easier to identify to a practitioner from the outside without imaging, whereas thoracic uh, abdominal aneurysms are much more difficult to identify externally. There may be some reported symptoms that the patient will present, but that should be diagnosed by a medical physician. So basically what you're looking at is known tears, refer, don't treat suspected tears or fractures. So known tears or fractures, don't treat. The area, no suspected tears or fractures, refer out. Rebound tenderness of the abdominal region, refer out. Known or suspected aneurysms, Suspected aneurysms refer out, known aneurysms don't treat the area. So that is the concept of pelvic flexion.